last week we talked about the cross, we celebrated it on Good Friday, and we talked about how Jesus' ultimate sacrifice on the cross was for each and every one of us. But that was not the end of the story, which is what brings us to today, on Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the end of that specific moment in Jesus' uh, ministry in his life here on earth, where he defeated death and walked out of the tomb door. All right? And this door specifically takes us and allows us to see something about Jesus that maybe none of us have opened up our hearts and our minds to see in the past. So when I, was, when I was looking through this um, passage, when I was studying for what it is that we were going to look at today, I really wanted to try and come at this from a different perspective. You know, when we look at an empty tomb, it automatically tells us something, right? The fact that nothing is there gives us something to grab, and that specific something is that the Savior has risen. Right? So because the tomb was empty, the Savior has risen, and that's what we're celebrating today. A lot of churches, t- and there's nothing wrong with this, and there's moments in our lives where we need to come uh, to those that don't necessarily follow or believe in God and say, hey, I need to try, I want to try and show you, give you some truth, some proof to the existence of God. And sometimes this is the day to do that. But today, I didn't feel like that's where God wanted us to go. So I'm not here today to try and prove anything to anyone. God has proven himself already. I don't need to do that this morning. So today, instead, what we're going to do, instead of trying to prove something, we're going to proclaim something. And the difference is when you try and prove something, you're demonstrating a truth. Right? You're trying to demonstrate that this right here is, is truth, is actual, and you need, to, you need to grab this because of the truth that it holds. Instead, what we're going to be talking about uh, is, is we're going to be declaring right? Declaring, not demonstrating, but declaring the truth of Jesus, right? And the fact that he rose from the dead. We're proclaiming. And this story in Matthew 28, what I just read to you guys, we're going to see multiple different situations, multiple different people that proclaim a certain truth about who Jesus is. And that's what we're going to do together this morning. We are going to proclaim the risen Savior, and we're going to see some different things that show us, well, what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us to proclaim Jesus in different areas of our lives, and how can we do that? So let's look back at verse 1 in chapter 28 of Matthew. It says, Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb to visit the tomb. So number one, our hearts proclaim, declare, right, a desire for a risen Savior. Our hearts proclaim a desire, right? Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were were still, even in his death, even when he was not with them anymore and they saw his crucifixion, they still were drawn to Jesus. So much so that they were going to go and visit him at the tomb because they wanted to be as close to him as they possibly could, even not knowing what it was that was about to happen. They were drawn to him. Their heart's desire was to be near Jesus. And when God created us, he created us with a desire in our hearts. Our hearts are an indication that we do desire a risen Savior. Why? Because outside of a risen Savior, there is no hope. Outside of a risen Savior, we don't have things to go after. I mean, think about this. When you are filling your life with all these different things in your, uh, that the world offers, right? To make you happy, to give you satisfaction, to give you a peace and a hope in your life. The world says, hey, if you want peace, here, put some more money in that cup and that will make you better. Hey, get a, a, a better job and that will make, get a, a, a family, that will make you better. Do this, do that, build these relationships, have these different things. And we keep on trying to fill our hearts with all of these different things, right? We have, that's why we're addicted to so many different things. You know, if, if, if I just take this, it'll numb the pain, or I drink that, it'll get rid of this, or I go here, it will do that, or I, or I focus my time on this and I ignore everything else, my cup will be filled and I will no longer need anything. And the fact is that God, when he created us, he created us with a natural desire, but we are covering it up with all of the world's whims. 
and we don't allow God to fill our cup, and because we don't allow it, we continue to fall down. We continue to seek out more things, and we need to understand that our heart is, is created, created to desire a risen Savior. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. God's masterpiece, when he created us, he built within us these plans, these ideas, these, these things, these desires that he has for us a long time ago. Psalm 73 says, for, I, uh, for have I in heaven but... For whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. When was the last time we actually felt that way? Where the thing that we desired more than anything on earth was Jesus. Like that's a hard thing to be honest with yourself about. That the number one thing that I want is Jesus more than anything else. Right? When was the last time we were, that was an honest truth in our lives? See, when he created us, there's an, there's an automatic relationship made here. Right? The creation should desire the creator. It's just how it should be. When we, cre- when we are, cre- I mean, think about it with parents and kids. Right? Kids automatically want who? Mommy. And then if she's not on Daddy. And if they're not around, then the dog, like whatever it is, like they have a desire to be close to the the, the things that are closest to them, right? They desire that in their heart. They don't even know why. They just want it. Listen, I've been a foster parent for a long time, and I've seen kids come through our home that are just, I mean, you wouldn't believe what they've been through. And yet, you know who they always want to go back to? Mom. It's a natural thing that's built inside of them. And it's built inside of us when we were created. The creation should desire the creator. And because of that, when we try and fill our lives with all these other things, we always end up back where we started, trying to fill it with something else. Because it didn't work. Our hearts proclaim, declare, a desire for a risen Savior because outside of Jesus, there is no real hope. There's nothing else that can give you real hope outside of Jesus. Other things can pretend, but they won't actually give you that hope. So let's look at this. As as they visited the tomb, verse two, suddenly there was a great earthquake. Number two, the earth even proclaims the news of a risen Savior. You know, this is a fitting uh, example right here because as, the, as Jesus rose from the dead, the earth proclaimed, right? There was this earthquake that Jesus is now alive. When he died three days earlier, what happened at his death on the cross? There was a great earthquake. The earth shook. The temple was destroyed. The curtain was ripped, right? The, the, there's this idea that the earth itself is telling us who God is, who Jesus is, how great he is. I mean, the earth shook at his death, and then the earth shook again at his resurrection. The earth tells us that how great, it declares the news, right? When you think of a newspaper, what is it? When someone's handing out newspapers, what do they say? You know, extra, extra, read all about it, right? You now have a, a, de- a need, a desire. I got to read what's on that paper, I gotta know what everybody else knows. I gotta understand what's happening. I gotta read what's there because it's obviously gonna have value in my life. And that's the same thing that the earth does for us when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to God. It proclaims the news of God. And when you look outside, when you see a sunrise or a sunset, when you look at the animals, when you look at the trees, when you look at everything around you, it proclaims the news, the information, the fact that God is there. Outside of God, none of this would be possible. And he's saying, hey guys, you want to know who I am? Check out the acorn that became the tree. That's who I am. You want to know who I am? Look at the, 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 the platypus. That's who I am. You want to understand who I am? Look at the technology that I put within the minds of my children. 
that allows you to do what you do, the food that you get to enjoy, right? The sounds that you hear that can only come from a creative and amazing God. That's who I am, and I am proclaiming. The, the earth is proclaiming the news. Job 12 says that just ask the animals, and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. Speak to the earth, and they will instruct you. Let the fish in the sea speak to you, for, all, uh, for they all know that my disaster has come from the hand of the Lord. For the life of every living thing is in the hands of God and the breath of every human being. He is the author of, and finisher of life. He's created everything. And the, the fish and the birds and the animals, they all speak to the news, to the reality, to the truth of God. Romans 1.20 says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Right? There's no excuse for not knowing who he is. Why? Because extra, extra, read all about it. It's everywhere. And you can see it. You can see him there. And the earth, even in this moment, at his resurrection, proclaimed the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. This is everywhere, and there is no excuse. Let's keep reading uh, verse 2. It says, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, and then an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And he rolled aside the stone, and, the, uh, and his face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. Number three, the angel proclaimed the glory of a risen Savior. The glory of a risen Savior. What is the glory? The glory is the best. Look at the messenger, right? Look who came to tell us. Who's handing the newspaper out? Look who came to tell us the news of a risen Savior. It was an angel. I mean, we, we learn that if you look at Scripture, throughout Scripture, all these big events that are happening, angels are coming to proclaim, to tell us about the big news that everybody wants us to hear. When you think about the birth of Jesus, when he came down to earth, what did the shepherds see in the field? There was a chorus of angels that numbered the stars in the sky, and they were singing, hey, do you realize who's here now? Right? The messenger is important. The message is important as well, but so is the messenger. And this angel came, and, and he's proclaiming the glory, the glory of who it is that's risen from the grave. The angel proclaiming that glory, and in Revelation 5, 11 through 12, it says, Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne, and of the living uh, beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus. Now they're about to give us Jesus' resume for what you could have in your life if you accept him and if you follow him, if you proclaim his name. It says, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered, which happened what? Friday, right? So Friday 2,000 years ago, Jesus died as the lamb on the cross for us. And then to do that, why he did it? So we could receive power and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessings. And they just kept going, and going, and going. And that's who Jesus is. The angels are proclaiming just how amazing he is. And that's why the angel came and proclaimed that to the women at the tomb. And he says, I want you to get how big of a deal this Jesus is, and how big of a, uh, of a moment and the glory that you could have in it if, if you proclaim his name. You declare that he is the risen Savior in your own life. That angel proclaimed it. In Hebrews 1.3 it says, He is the radiance of glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What greater power or security could you possibly have in your life than the guy that has all the power and all the blessings and all the riches 
and all the everythings, then you could have that. See, that's what declaring, proclaiming the name of Jesus can mean in your life. And listen, you're not going to declare or proclaim anything that you really don't want to follow. You get that? Like, you might say it like a loud whisper. Hey, are you a Christian? Yeah. You go to church? Yeah. Or are you like, yeah, I know Jesus. Right? It's like, I mean, we're, go- we're so enthusiastic about our sports teams, right? I mean, ask me why. I was yelling at the TV yesterday with the Red Sox, right? Like, come on, what are you doing? I'm declaring it. I'm proclaiming it. Why? Because I care about it. I'm passionate about it. When you proclaim something, when you declare something, man, that's, it's, it's real. And that's what proclaiming Jesus' name is. You're not going to proclaim something you don't love and care about. So do we proclaim the glory of that risen Savior? Keep reading verse 3. It says that his face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. And then verse 4, And the guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Number 4, the guards proclaimed the miracle of a risen Savior. It was a miracle that was so amazing that it shocked them dead. They weren't really dead. They fainted, right? Shocked them right into a faint. That's how amazing that miracle was that they met right there. Like when they met Jesus, it knocked them over. The guards and their reaction to him proclaimed, declared the miracle of a risen Savior. Isaiah 35 says, And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. He'll unplug the ears of the deaf. He says the lame will leap like a deer. Those who cannot speak, they won't just talk. They will sing with joy. Springs will gush out forth in the wilderness and streams of water from the wasteland. Every single miracle will come when you meet Jesus. The, God, the guards were sitting there and they met him and they found that miracle and it knocked him out. I mean, the miracles of Jesus are unbelievable. But if you never declare, proclaim the name of Jesus in your life, you can't experience those miracles. Right? You don't get to see what the, you know, I talk about it all the time. Do you see the blessing? Do you see it? Like when you hear your kid laugh or giggle, do you see it? Do you see the blessing? Right? When you get to bite into that burger and it's all juicy and yummy, do you see the miracle? The glory? When you see a life of addiction turned around, do you see it? The guards saw Jesus. They saw the miracle of it. Right? I wish we knew what happened to him afterwards. All right? We know that they kind of got scolded. But what happened? Like, what, where, where do they go? Like, when they wake up, like, whoa. What did we just see? What did I just experience? How could that even be possible? A miracle. I didn't even think I could have that in my life. I was standing here, and when I woke up, with Jesus, the experience of Jesus, the, the, the person of Jesus, proclaiming Jesus, now I ended up here. I never thought that'd be possible to have that miracle in my life. Well, what kind of miracles? Look at John 21, 25. Jesus also did many other things. And if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Like, You can't even number the miracles that could happen in your life if you focus in on Jesus. Sometimes I wish they wrote him down, even if it took all the books in the world, because then maybe more of us would focus in on him and grab the gift that is Jesus. But we get this, an amazing, amazing picture of who Jesus was as he walked on this earth. And it says that if you you even just knew what he was. You could see what he wants to do in your life. Just proclaim that name. Grab that. 
Man, the miracles. The miracles will fill the books of the world in your life. That's what he can give to you. That's what he can do in your life. That's what he wants. We only have the smallest little snippet of what it is that Jesus did while he was here on earth. If you want more, proclaim the name of Jesus, and you can have that. Keep reading. It says, uh, then the angels, in verse 5, spoke to the women. Don't be afraid. He said, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. Where his body was lying. Number five, the empty tomb proclaimed the power of a risen Savior. The power of a risen Savior. Right? The power, what kind of power? Power greater than even death. That's the power that you can have. The risen Savior shows us that even amongst all the things that are happening in our lives, when you have Jesus, when you have that power in your life, now all of a sudden everything changes. Everything shifts. The empty tomb, even though it was empty, it still showed us something. It taught us something. There is power in that risen Savior. And that same power you can have in your own lives. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is, the living, is living by God's power. And that power can live inside of each and every one of us. The power of a risen Savior. 1 Peter 1, 3-5. All praise to God. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we get to live with great expectation. And we get to have priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled. Beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive that salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. That power of a risen Savior. Dead man walking, right? You know the difference between Jesus? Like we have a lot of religions in the world. right? A lot of different options for you guys to choose from if you, if you want to. But the difference between my Jesus and all of these other religious heads, you know like Muhammad and Buddha and John Smith, and all these different people that are out there that are, that are driving this different type of religion into our lives. You know what the difference is between Jesus and them? They're all dead, and Jesus rose from the grave. He's alive. He's still there. See, the power that you get with Jesus is one that is greater than death. It's greater than depression. It's greater than, than debt. It's greater than sickness. It's greater than than any pain you could experience. It's the greatest power you could have. So great that even death. I mean, think about the things in our lives that we consider to be permanent and devastating. Right? Man, if she breaks up with me, my life's over. Right? So devastating. Right? If I lose this job, my life is over. If, if, if my kids don't go down this path, if I can't have that thing, if I can't pay that bill, right? All of a sudden these things that we, we consider to be so uh, life altering or changing or ending. But what's the one thing that every single one of us fear that we can't do anything about? It's death right? Death. We all fear it. We all have this, this, this yearning inside of us not to experience it. Not only for ourselves, but for the loved ones around us, for people in our lives. We don't want, listen, listen, if you don't pay your bill, like, I'm going to feel bad for you. I might even help you out, but like, come on, we'll be okay. But man, 
I would hurt if you were to die. Like death. Like, I, I've been saved since I was 13. I mean, this whole, like, Christian thing, like the pastor thing that I said, this is my life. This is what I do. And there are moments where I still fear death. Not because I don't know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And it's going to be awesome. Like, I can't wait to get to heaven. It's going to be an amazing thing to experience. But, man, I, am, I just I don't want to go yet. You know, I got so much I want to do. I want to walk my daughter down the aisle. I want to see what kind of men my boys turn into. I want to live my life that God has given to me. I'm a Christian. I proclaim the name of Jesus, but death still stings a little bit. Right? But the power of of Jesus is greater than even death. I don't have to fear it. Sometimes I do, but I don't have to. I have an option here, and it's proclaiming the name of Jesus. That's what the empty tomb does for us. It gives us that salvation. Look at verse 7. It says, and now, he says, go quickly. Tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you uh, to Galilee. And look at this. You will see him there. Number seven, or six, I'm sorry. The presence of Jesus proclaims the gift of a risen Savior. The presence of Jesus proclaims the gift. See, we talked about it a minute ago. These guys are dead. My Jesus is alive. But you know what? Not only is he alive, but he is present. Right? He didn't just rise from the dead and then gone. He goes, look, Jesus rose from the dead. Now go and meet him. Go and find him. Go and talk with him. And walk with him. And have a relationship with him. He may have rose from the dead, but he did not leave you behind. And he desires to meet you on the road where you're walking now. He told her, he says, go down the road towards Galilee and find Jesus walking there with you. The presence of Jesus proclaims the gift of a risen Savior. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. He is the one and only opportunity to get to heaven is Jesus Christ. We often use that as a verse to kind of show that, you know, this is the answer, those are not the answers. Right? And that's truth, and that's how we should live, and, and that's an understanding that we all need to have. But I look at this verse this morning as kind of like a, a push to hope, because we're already standing over here trying to fill ourselves with all these other things. He say, hey, Mike, Mike, pay attention. That's not going to work. I know the world's telling you that, and I know that you think that this might be a good idea because maybe in your mind it makes sense. If I have this, I'm going to be happy. If I get this, it's going to work out. And he's saying that stuff isn't what's going to work. The name of Jesus, that's what's going to give you salvation. That's what's going to give you hope. That's what's going to give you peace. That's what's going to give you light at the end of the tunnel and a place to hope for. The presence of him is a gift, a gift that each and every one of us gets to have. 1 Timothy 3.16, without question, this is the greatest mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body, vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels, announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. And yet we still, we still choose to go towards this pile of other stuff to vindicate, to help, to fill, to give us guidance in this life. And we ignore the presence of Jesus. 
Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, trans- transferred us from into the kingdom with his dear son, who purchased our freedom, and he forgave our sins. See, what greater gift, what greater gift than to go from darkness to light, to go from from an unknown future to truth and peace. What greater things could we ask for in our lives than to leave bondage and find freedom? And yet we still, we're holding on to something. And we're not taking the gift that's right in front of us, which is what? A risen Savior. And when you proclaim that, what you get is amazing. I mean, what are we waiting for? I mean, our hearts proclaim a risen Savior, the need of one. The earth proclaims the risen Savior. The people around us, just looking at them and understanding the miracles of this world, proclaim a risen Savior. Everything in our lives points to the need, the desire, the hope, what we can have in a risen Savior. And that's what he's done already, taking that gift. It's like the one gift that we all sit there and just like, eh, I'm good. We're celebrating a birthday in our home today. Our little foster boy Braxton turns four. So if you saw him earlier, you say happy birthday, Braxton. But man, we told him yesterday, we're like, what's tomorrow? My birthday? We're like, we can guess what, buddy? You're going to get a gift. Oh, what is it? What's the gift? Can I have it now? No, you got to have it tomorrow. Can I have it now? No, you got it. It's tomorrow. When, when can I have it? Tomorrow. But it's a gift. Yes, it's for you. Anybody else? Got, no, it's your gift. Tomorrow. He's so excited about the gift, right? I mean, we all like gifts. We all love those gifts. And yet, this one gift, we're ignoring why don't ignore the gift the proclaiming name of a risen savior will you proclaim the name of jesus today well how do you do it one isaiah 59 2 says that we're all separated from god by one thing it's sin sin separates us from god He does not want to be in the presence of sin. So it's a separation, a barrier. And Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of that glory. Meaning that we all have that separation issue in our lives. We cannot be in communion with God when we have that sin separating us. And Romans 6.23 says... The wages of that sin is death, but, but, but there's a gift. And that gift is eternal life with Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus himself, right? The proclamation of a risen Savior is the gift that will get rid of that separation. And Romans 10 says that if you declare with your mouth and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, that he loved you so much, that death had zero sting on him, then you can be saved. You can have that. But you have to proclaim the name of Jesus. And not just be like, heavy whisper, even a quiet shout. You gotta proclaim the name of Jesus in your life. And when you do that, The miracles will fill the pages of the books in your life. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for what you've given to each and every one of us. A gift, an opportunity, a moment, a choice that we get to make. As we stand before you in this moment, God, may you humble and change each and every one of us. May our hearts and our minds turn to focus on you, leaving all other things aside. May we come before you on our knees, open to what you have. 
Friend, if you're sitting there today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want you to make that choice today. And when I say make that choice, I mean you've got to decide yes or no. If you want to accept Jesus, if you want to proclaim the name of the risen Savior in your life, then you say this prayer between you and him, between you and God in your heart, in your mind. You make a decision. You say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that sin separates me from you. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I want to change direction in my life. I want to follow you from this day forward. Make you the leader of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for defeating death three days later, rising from the grave and coming after me, for knocking on my door, for caring enough about me. Save me today. Christian, if you're sitting there now, you're off track, you're not where you should be, you know you have the Holy Spirit. He's been kicking you in the butt this whole time. Listen to him. Listen to what God wants for you. Receive the miracles and the blessings in your life that he created inside of you, that he planned for you so many years ago. Get on that path that he wants you to walk. Repent. Change direction. Refocus on God. God, thank you for your majesty, for your glory. And Lord, we ask that as we go through our lives, as we take our next steps as we go through our days at work, at school. We walk down the the sidewalk. We go to the grocery store. Lord, may we walk proclaiming the name of Jesus in our lives. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We ask all these things in your saving and loving grace. Amen.